Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jerzy Balanowski and welcome to our next lecture in the series of uh, data analytics. We Today we will be focusing on multi-parameter models in STAN. Uh, again, this lecture is a compilation of earlier lectures from the last year with some, heavy, some editing. This one is especially heavily edited because I've added mo some more new content to, uh, to the lecture and uh, we can now move to the case of uh, what we, of multi-parameter models. Thank you very much. Uh, what do we mean by multiple parameters? Uh, multiple parameters, uh, we have multiple unknown or unobservable quantities. For example, in electrical circuits, which would be parameters of a circuit we are interested in. In kind of, it's a kind of social relationships we want, well, like to know what are the influences of particular actors on the outcome. In case of COVID-19, uh, we would be interested in modeling of uh, infection rates or death rates or transmission rates. All those parameters are interacting each other in order to create our model. However, in many cases we are mostly interested in only a few parameters because that happens when our model is complicated and we want to know, find out certain quantities of interest. For example, in COVID-19 modeling, we, would, we might be interested in the prediction of new infections. We maybe not, are not that interested in particular parameters regarding transmissions, at least not for current purposes, but we would like to get those parameters that we're interested in. And for that, there's an advantage of Bayesian statistics, we can marginalize it. So we can take our joint distribution of uh, measurements and parameters and extract from that uh, certain, uh, extract from that only the values that we have. However, with all the consequences of having a marginal distribution. So we can generally split our parameter vectors into parameter of interest and nuisance parameters. Nuisance that in those are just uh, obfuscating our view. So generally we can split our vector. If we assume that parameters constitute a vector, we can split this vector into one, into theta one and theta two. And for example, in normal distribution, we might be interested only in mean value. So what is the expected value, for example, of mentioned uh, inspections and we're not that interested in the variance or standard deviation of the uh, of the distribution so formally having our joint posterior density that is the that is proportional to the uh, likelihood times prior on our parameters we can average this distribution over the uh, of, uh, over par nuisance parameters. So in, in a way we can integrate those parameters uh, out of the equations. This is of course formal statement of the problem. Formal that is uh, we won't be computing such integrals in most of cases. Why? Because it's general integration is hard and analytical uh, integration is very hard and getting multi-value integrals of anything except absolutely basic functions is extremely difficult. Uh, so what we'll be doing, we will be taking samples of uh, our distributions in order to marginalize our distribution by sampling. And what is the marginal distribution anyway? This, in case of our posterior distribution of interest, so distribution of parameter t vector theta 1, parameters of interest, conditional on our measurements, it is a mixture of conditional posterior distribution given our nuisance parameters with a weighting function that is the uh, distribution of possible values of theta 2. So we can kind of averaging our distribution assuming certain weights depending on how probable are certain values of theta 2. So we want to remove theta 2 by averaging the results. So we are kind of creating, as usually in Bayesian uh, 
uh, statistic, we are comp creating a compromise between data and a prior knowledge. And data too can be either simple parameters uh, with continuous values, or it can be a discrete parameter with which can be interpreted as a multiple sub model. So we will be integrating or summing out values of uh, parameters depending on multiple different models. Usually, we do not compute marginal distribution directly, but we uh, get them from sampling. So that's what, what, what we'll be doing uh, in multiple cases. So let's start with a most basic concept with so normal distribution. Normal distribution you should already know from multiple with statistics uh, and which is a distribution that is uniquely defined by its mean and variance. Uh, we at first we'll focus on an independent observation from a univariate normal distribution. So normal distribution of one variable dependent on two parameters. Everyone knows the bell-shaped curve and uh, we are uh, going, starting with very non-informative prior distributions. Generally, uh, non-informative distributions for no normal uh, case can be defined in multiple ways. However, if we go strictly non-informative, we, we need to assume that uh, any value of me is possible. So we can assume a uniform probability, which we will generally won't be doing in more complicated cases uh, but this is useful for analytical computation because it will be much much, uh, much easier for us. And we assume that any scale is possible. So our variance, we don't know is this variance of 1% or thousands of percents. Or, uh, so in order to get any possible scale we uh, of, uh, of our uh, variance, we do not focus, or our sum deviation in this case, we do not focus on the... Uh, we cannot put uniform distribution for that because that won't give us all possible scales because scales can differ by order of magnitude. However, if we assume that a logarithm is uniform, a unique logarithm of standard deviation is uniformly distributed, then we have access to all possible scales. All orders of magnitudes can be easily realized. And returning to uh, normal variables, our distribution for mean and variance could be uh, the uniform, uh, proportional to uniform, so uniform, uh, so a constant probability for all values of me and the uh, and uh, function of one divided by uh, sigma squared uh, for the variance components. What we have here is a standard non-informative prior uh, that can be divided, uh, derived from Jeffrey's prior, so-called Jeffrey's prior, which is a historically very important result. Uh, of times when we didn't want to use any information in priors if it wasn't absolutely necessary. The main flaw of this approach is that our unbounded uniform prior for mean and uh, this prior for uh, variance is uh, not proper. That is, it won't integrate to one and it can cause certain issues in general cases. That's why among the others, they are not be, uh, they are now being discouraged from using. We can use different non-informative prior or almost as non-informative, uh, but practically not introducing any issues to our uh, to our computation. But that we'll we'll do, we'll do later in discussing this topic. However, having such form of prior for our two parameters, as you see, because me is uniform, it does not uh, is is not presented directly in the formula, uh, we can do some computation. And here uh, we can see how it, how it's generally look like. So in order to get to uh, our n measurements, our likelihood consists of multiple values of uh, Expon uh, exponential uh, of no normal distribution. We, because each of these events, are, uh, the, their products are multiplied by each other, so in each of the instances is assumed, uh, we can be assumed independently distributed, we can compute each of, uh, our likelihood is, is a multiplication of 
li uh, likelihoods for each of these samples. And because our normal distribution is exponential distributions, we can use the option of multiplying multiple normal distributions by each other by getting in an exponent a sum of all those exponents. Because we have the same base, so uh, multiplication of multiple uh, exponential functions with the same base results in an exponent, uh, exponent of uh, sum of those. Uh, it is a base up to the, uh, the, the power of some uh, exponents. And what you had he here, in case of our normal uh, distribution, we always have the uh, have the term of 1 divided by sigma times a certain con uh, constant related to square root and pi, and we have square, uh, sigma squared in the uh, in the likelihood, in the normal likelihood. So, we get our prior, which is represented here by my minus 2, and we get uh, th uh, this form. What is important, that we can see here, we can decompose this sum into certain useful components. First of all, we can express all our measurements in the form of y bar, which is the empirical mean of all our measurements. So we take an arithmetic mean or empirical arithmetic mean of our measurements and we get a function y bar. Simple uh, comput uh, computation shows us that this sum can be decomposed by differences between our measurements and y bar squared plus n, so number of measurements, times y bar minus mi, so our mean of our distribution, also squared. And that term is related by n minus 1 to an estimator of variance. So uh, we can get the uh, our uh, esti uh, standard estimated variance, so s squared in this case will be the average, but with the n minus one, uh, n minus one division, of measurement minus the expected mean value. So this is the estimator of variance. This is the estimator of mean, and those two values, so y bar and s squared, are so called sufficient statistics of normal distribution. As you can see, all the information required for estimation of those parameters by no using no no advanced tricks here just by simple multiplications can be represented by those two values so we don't have to considering this uh, uh, considering this uh, model we don't have to analyze each data point uh, separately we can just represent them by mean and variance uh, estimators uh, from our data so those sufficient statistics will be enough to, to do all our computation, which is useful because leads us to some kind of analytical result and also uh, gives basis for multiple different different computations. So our chain posterior distribution is really dependent only on those sufficient statistics. It is not uh, uh, we don't have to use dependence on the entire data. So only on two values, uh, two, two numerical values, we can get our the, our distribution of our parameters will be. Uh, our posterior distribution is dependent of sigma and mi is dependent only on those two parameters of our data set. So, what we can actually do here, we can do some kind of factorization of our joint posterior distribution to even improve our analytical result, uh, because we can uh, rather directly obtain the marginal posterior for sigma squared. Sigma squared is this value that we are not that interested in. Uh, we, however, uh, would need that in order to use the uh, conditional posterior distribution of mi, because our mi will be conditional on sigma squared and conditional on uh, measurements. In order to integrate sigma squared from this equation, we will need the posterior uh, distribution, so sigma squared conditional on measurements of uh, uh, of, of our, our variance. So this can be expressed as this integral by integrating out the mean, which is kind of counterintuitive in what we are doing, but we are doing 
analytical computation here. We are not going for uh, numerical re results yet. So, what do we, uh, why we want to do such things? Because this can be observed that this is a so-called normal integral. So, this is something that can be computed because it's really integral of a norm, certain slightly modified normal distribution dependent on sigma squared. Sigma is not a variable in this integration. So certain things can be get turned out of the uh, equation. And this becomes a no integral on the entire support, so minus plus infinity of normal distribution, which is known to be one or with certain parameters scaled thing. So this will be, uh, this, this thing can be scaled out and because uh, can be integrated out. So because of that, we will we can get directly the uh, equation for uh, uh, it can be uh, can it can be directly into this this formula, which is a scaled form on so-called inverse chi square distribution, which can be useful because inverse chi square distribution can be uh, is usually uh, implemented in multiple numerical libraries and because of that it can be easily sampled from or can be analyzed by numerical computation without any problems. So we can get, we, we can, from this derivation we get that our sigma squared is distributed, uh, conditional on y, is distributed as inverse key squared parameterized by uh, our variance estimator as squared. So as, as again only one sufficient statistic is needed in order to get the distribution, the marginal distribution of sigma squared. And this factorization, so expressing our uh, joint posterior as a multiplication uh, of me dependent on the uh, uh, sigma squared and y, so our normal distribution, which we can see here, because this is the, this is a normal distribution dependent on uh, sigma squared, and uh, getting distribution of sigma squared conditional on uh, measurements, we can do things like we can sample sigma squared from its probability, which is again known by inverse chi squared, and then we can draw me from our normal distribution conditional on sigma squared. So this will get us the values of our. Uh, this will get, get us get us values from. Uh, the get value, values from me and. Repeated simulation. So from multiple limit, uh, uh, repeated sampling first from sigma squared distribution, then from me, uh, we get values of me. That, so we could get values of me marginalized over sigma squared. So without analytical integration, we can pe perform this marginalization. But in this special case, which again, we have a special case of special case, we can see that this problem is also analytically solvable because our original distribution can be uh, integrated by a certain substitution in this square, uh, case uh, uh, using uh, substitution of uh, z instead of sigma uh, squared scaled by the uh, uh, and, and me squared by this value but for integration by a sigma squared so we will be integrating our joint posterior distribution for me and sigma squared uh, integrating by sigma squared and doing this substitution for sigma squared so z equal uh, constant but dependent on me divided by two sigma squared we can get relatively simple integration of uh, z, z to a certain power time exponent, uh, exponent, which after certain computation leads us to, uh, especially that this, uh, this part is really, uh, uh, the, this part is not independent on me because me can be removed out of our equation here. So this integration will be just a number, so we are left again with only a, it becomes so-called student's t distribution, which we will be returning today, uh, to it later. And this, uh, uh, and this thing uh, with n minus one degrees of freedom, so the more sample, samples the result is higher, the t, uh, t distribution 
when n going to infinity becomes again a normal distribution but this is a result which are not interested too much today and but again we can get our results of our marginal distribution of me as a student's distribution conditional only on sufficient statistics of the data and uh, because of that we can perform uh, one more thing we can perform a posterior predictive distribution for a future observation so we can estimate our future observation which things we will be doing we are doing our previous lecture with binomials and with uh, uh, and with Poisson distributions we can predict new values conditional on just on the uh, on the on the previous outputs and this can be of course done by double integration of the uh, of our previous samples. So the first two factors of inner integrals is just the normal distribution for future observation given by the values of me and sigma squared and does not depend on previous measurements, which is very good situation because there is kind of hidden in the uh, in the con previous conditions. So the, you have no, there is no direct influence on y wave, or y tidal, on measured y. So ju we just have on those two parameters. So because our measurements are independently distributed with this uh, with this distribution. Uh, so re really, in order to perform predictive uh, uh, distribution, we just need to sample from our posterior for me and sigma, and then we can simulate our uh, values of y. And we will be doing it again with different examples today, or during this topic. Let's, so this is part of the theory, how we are wo working here. We can derive certain analytical results but those analytical results are not really what we are interested in this top, uh, in this course, because analytical results are very nice, but only for limited, simple problems that we really won't encounter in real life. So we'll just for, uh, now try, uh, focus on how to model this problem in Stan and see how it's working. So uh, let's skip certain uh, again toys with the terminal and just focus on our own. Let's focus on so-called Newcomb's experiment. Newcomb's experiment was an experiment in 1882 of measuring the speed of light. Uh, Newcomb has measured the amount of time required for the light to travel a distance of 7442 meters uh, and there is a set of, uh, set of measurements, we'll observe it in a moment, uh, there are 66 uh, measurements, which uh, we will try to use a normal model, so estimate with certain measures of uncertainty of our uh, of getting a normal distribution in order to estimate the speed of light, which will be represented for us by a marginal distribution of uh, me. And what, because in this case, our result uh, works here, uh, because uh, this distribution is a uh, student distribution with 65 uh, degrees of freedom, because we have 66 uh, measurements minus 1. Degrees of freedom is a parameter of the distribution. Uh, we'll see uh, how, which, because he is represented here, and this is n. So it's uh, influencing the shape of our distribution, uh, and especially its tails. So. We have our sufficient statistics, so we have the y, uh, y bar, which is 26.2, and as uh, sample standard division is s is equal to 10.8, so we can square it if necessary. And so assuming, again, non-informative prior distribution for me and sigma, uh, we can get the 95% uh, central posterior interval for me, uh, we can obtain it here. And uh, our data looks might look differently because, as you can see, a mean is 26.2. What, what does it mean? It means that uh, the data is recorded as deviations from uh, 24,800 nanoseconds. So we had this was a reference value, and we are just looking at the difference for this. And we will compare these analytical results with what we can do with standard model. 
So again, some packages, we will be skipping it in, uh, in the future. You can see it again on GitHub and we get our data. The data, will, you will be provided the data with this uh, in the file like txt, which is, uh, uh, it will be in the new comp folder in the multi-parameter models uh, in the repository. As you can see, it's a light txt uh, file and uh, we will be, which will be, again, you won't have the uh, cached models uh, before, uh, as before, so you have to compile it yourself to see how it, how it works. And uh, what we are doing here, we're just reading we're reading the table, which is in a, uh, in a text file. This text file is, as you can see, uh, unformatted, ju just numbers, positive and negative integers. Uh, and uh, what we'll be doing here, we'll, we're just making a histogram. And this histogram, uh, which could be, pr could be a bit prettier, but let's uh, don't focus on that too much. And uh, the histogram of Newcom measurements is interesting because we have two very low measurements and the rest of them is kind of normally distributed. We start with assuming a normal model and then we will, uh, we will see what's going on. And uh, I've created a model which uh, works like this. We have the, uh, as a data, we get number of samples and uh, and our measurements. We will, in this case, just to be brief, because we have a lot of theory, we won't be discussing prior uh, prior, prior prior checks. We will do it in our next example. But for this uh, case, we just start with, with a model. Our model has two parameters, sigma and me. So we will be estimating both standard deviation of our uh, our distribution, our uh, well, standard distribution of our model, uh, standard, division of, standard division of our model, and uh, its expectation, and we will be having this parameter. Me can be a real number. Sigma has to be positive, uh, and uh, uh, we created our model. And this is something new which you haven't seen before, uh, because previously we created our stand models using so-called sampling statements. So we defined how certain parameter is distributed. Now we are use, we are defining the uh, our distribution or as the uh, we are defining our uh, our distribution uh, as uh, logarithmic uh, of, as a logarithm of uh, uh, joint uh, joint posterior distribution. Because of that, this is formally identical situation. As you can see, it's getting darker and darker uh, in my place because night is coming. Uh, either way, mm, what uh, we have here, our model is normal likelihood and this uh, an uninformative uh, sigma uh, uh, one by sigma squared uh, distribution. In order to do so, to specify this, uh, uh, our model using logarithmic likelihood, uh, logarithmic, uh, logarithmic, we need to add logarithms of all the terms of our uh, of our uh, posterior distribution. So we'll take our original model, which is uh, which is generally here, and we have our prior, and we have our uh, and we have our uh, likely. And we take logarithms of all those things, and we will be adding additional elements of that. So, our, in this case, our exponential uh, sum will be just a sum of normal likelihoods for each of samples, independently, and our uh, likelihood will be just log. Uh, our prior will be just a logarithm of sigma uh, squared. So it will be uh, of, my, uh, of minus two times logarithm of sigma plus. Uh, and there's a special functions defined for all distributions in and in Stan. So it will be normal LPDF, so logarithmic probability distribution function of y, so our measurements, so it's here, conditional on mu and sigma. Here we have we have a, a nice bonus of vectorization of this uh, data, so we will be able to uh, to do so uh, uh, such things. First modification to our lecture, because in Original lecture, 
the block of generated quantities was left unexplained. Here it's slightly corrected and has certain ordered here, so let's give some explanation. In our generated quantities block, we generate two things. First one is log algorithmic likelihood. So the actual likelihood of our probability distribution uh, uh, from our posterior conditional on our mi and sigma parameters from each sample with corresponding to each of the measurements. So this will be a vector for each of the sample of mu and sigma we will generate a vector of elements of likelihood that can uh, consist of our target. So we will get all the likelihoods for each of the each of the outputs. So this will be needed for uh, model comparison later in the lecture. The other thing we do which is the posterior predictive distribution. So using each of samples of mu and sigma we create new samples of y which we marked here as y hat so we generate a new set of measurements n measurements same here will be n measurements that we'll be using for posterior predictive checks so we'll be comparing how the distribution of our resulting samples are uh, is uh, uh, behaves in correspondence to our original data. So we will see how well our model captured the behavior of the observed data. So we get it our new data. Our, uh, in order to fit our model, our data will be n, so it will be number of samples, so length of our, uh, length of our data set, and our data set because we have only one parameter. So we perform uh, some fitting again we call the uh, our model, which was compiled by studying the earlier. We do uh, we send provided with data. We provide it with seed. Remember, providing seed is very very important. Doing computation, no problems uh, happens, and we extract our parameters of our model with uh, function extract, and we start. So let's do some plotting. And what is the problem? The problem that we can observe here is that actual speed of light is somewhere here. And our model locates its mean somewhere here. In particular at 26.2, uh, 95% uh, confidence interval uh, is 23.56 uh, to 28.87. Here is a slight uh, additional information. Uh, because in the lecture you see that we could compute the confidence interval using calling appropriate functions, of course HDI instead of HPD as in the lecture because of the Arvis update. However, we can even use Arvis even more by using Arvis summary function. So using our fit from common stand pi, we can now use the calling uh, appropriate variable names and choosing only statistics summary and setting the quantiles for the interval like here we can get a nice data frame that we'll be able to use as the uh, as the summary statistics so it gives us exactly the same information but just is in a slightly more pleasing form and comparing it to analytical results we get what we were expected to get so numerical result is equal to the analytical result which is we mentioned earlier posterior predictive check. In order to do posterior predictive check, we'll be using the, it in Arvis. In different uh, lectures, we'll be coding them ourselves, but this is also an option to use Arvis as a package of choice. In order to do posterior predictive checks and also model comparison, which we'll be using later, we have to use something called inference data. Fortunately, for most of statistical programming uh, languages, Arvis has appropriate helper functions that allows us to construct these inference data objects that construct, uh, contains multiple X arrays objects that are useful for all types of statistical analysts. Uh, first of all, we have to define the posterior, which we just used our MCMC sampling, uh, uh, constant by uh, MCMC sample object. We have to provide it with logarithmic likelihood, which we 
created using our generated quantities. It will take it from the fit object, but it ne needs the, uh, the, uh, the pass uh, passing of the name variable, variable, uh, variable name. Uh, the same can happen with the posterior predictive distribution, and in order to do posterior predictive checks, we need to provide it with observed data, and we provide it with the data of wh y which is used. If we call the other object in GeoPyter, we can see that it consists of posterior, which is an XRI data set consisting of chains and rows in these chains, and all those variables that are happening here. In posterior predictive distribution, it gives us the values of y hat, which will be a set of lists from each of the chains. Uh, from logarithmic likelihood, the same, we get the values of logarithmic likelihood. Uh, from sample stats, again, the same and observed data is the data that we used for the fitting. Uh, we call, we perform the posterior predictive check using the uh, plot PPC function from Avis, and these functions with some parameters that you can uh, track later when you'll be setting it, we just, from the important aspect, we need to give information which was the uh, how uh, we pair the input variables to the output variables so then if the names are not exactly the same in generated quantities in data and we uh, want to limit number of samples plotted instead of all entire four thousands of uh, plots because it will be unreadable we are not plotting observed data because our observed data because usually our uh, uh, plot ppc uses kernel density estimators in case of our data set uh, kernel density estimator of our, uh, our original data will be not very pretty, it will be unreadable. So we're replacing it with a histogram. We could also do it with histograms, but this is an option that is supposed to ha happen in Avis in future version, maybe next one. But now we have to use KDEs. Uh, and in this case, we just provide a histogram uh, of the observed data. So. As we can see here, this is a, another problem with normal distribution that is happening here. The normal distribution is much more diffuse than our observed data. Of course, it does not capture the outliers. The outliers are not, uh, the samples are not generated from the uh, posterior pr uh, predictive distribution that are similar to outliers. And also it's uh, too wide and too dispersed around the actual bulk of the data. So there are some problems that we'll have to address it in a moment. But let's try to tweak it a bit, because generally the problem with outliers is that normal distributions are very sensitive to outliers. Why? Because normal distributions have very thin tails, or thin or like, or very, very light, uh, uh, it's called light tail. So almost all the probability of, uh, uh, of uh, normal distribution is here. In the tails, these values are very, very small. So when data happens far away from the mean, then it suggests our model that something is wrong, that mean is somewhere else. So there's a very large sensitivity for that. And that, of course, has for sure drawn us from our actual uh, speed of light. So our Gaussian model has, uh, is biased by our outliers. So what can we really do? We can change our model. We can change our model to a model that allows for outliers. So a model that needs a heavier tails, tails that will allow that, okay, some probability of something happening here. This leads us to the uh, areas of robust estimation or robust regression in certain cases. So this will be something that will allow us to get estimates which won't be influenced by outliers so strongly and we won't be discussing too much here but just i wanted to give you certain highlights what can we do in stan with relative ease we can start to do some robust inference with students t likelihood so what actually is going on here uh, student t distribution is a distribution characterized by three parameters Degrees of freedom, location, and scale. Uh, in case of what we here, degrees of freedom control how thick the tails are, how heavy they are, 
how much probability is given in tails. The lower numbers of degrees of freedom, the thicker the tails. If they go to infinity, we get approaching normal distribution. Location is similar to mean. This is the location, location of the mode uh, of the distribution, depending on the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, student distribution might not have a mean at all, at least in the sense of uh, in, uh, it's a of operating integral. And the scale is uh, equivalent of variance, so how spread is this distribution? And here we have a one bit problem. We, we had an informative, uh, an informative mean for me and for sigma by using uh, uniforms in appropriate scales. However, we don't have any informative uh, prior for degrees of freedom. And uh, generally, in such cases, such priors should allow a situation of degrees of freedom going high. Why? Because that would suggest that, that we would have like to have a prior that won't enforce us to different model. It will just give certain possibility that our model might be normally distributed. So it might allow us going uh, number of degrees of freedom up to infinity. And selecting proper priors is difficult to access. However, there are certain uh, resources we can have. For example, at StanWiki, we have a page called Prior Choice Recommendation, and there is a suggestion of using a non-informative prior for the use of freedom, which is a gamma distribution parameters by 2 and 0 0.1. And this value allows, it's not, uh, there are other options, for example, using theory of penalized complexity prior, so we can do it, uh, something else. Maybe we'll discuss it later uh, during the course, however, especially during character modeling. However, in this case, uh, we need to provide certain uh, distribution, and this distribution is relatively well uh, well regarded in uh, as, uh, as an analysis option. So, what our models now looks like? Not much changes, except that one new parameters happen here. This is a degrees of freedom, again, bounded from zero. Uh, and we have our model, which in our model we've changed the likelihood to the student T uh, LPDF. So it's again, we're working with logarithms. Because of this uninformative prior for sigma, we still have to use logarithms. We cannot use, use state, sampling statement because 1 by sigma squared distribution, first of all, is not a proper distribution. It cannot be uh, given this way. And other thing, it can be uh, used uh, in this case, we can provide it easily. And we are adding. And a factor d, which will, in normal form it will be a factor. So the probability of uh, degrees of freedom, uh, value of degrees of freedom. But in this case, we are adding a logarithm of it. So we are adding uh, gamma LPDF so for our parameter uh, 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 to uh, zero uh, with parameters to zero point one. Two words about generated quantities block. Uh, in this case, uh, it is almost the same as in previously. We are adding log likelihood and the uh, y hat, so the pro uh, the pro uh, posterior uh, predi uh, predictions. And in this case, the difference is that instead of using the Gaussian distribution, we are using student t distribution with our estimated degrees of freedom, location, and scale. And that's it. Those things are being uh, created using our uh, genetic quantity block and that's that's it so not much difference to the previous. and what we are doing here again compilation we fit our model using the uh, using using stan providing with the same data as before because nothing changes in this regard uh, we provide it with with seed everything works very nice we get our parameters and we can get another histogram. And what's happened here? Well, our authors are, aren't changed. Uh, we have not got speed of light correctly anyway. Why? First of all, the experiment was bad. This is an old experiment from the 19th century. And there are certain things. We have improved over our Gaussian model because as you can see here, the mean of Gaussian model is on the left of the location of our uh, mode of our distribution. In uh, this case, the mean of our 
uh, marginal distribution for the uh, mini, so for our, uh, the speed of light for our, from our model, really, uh, is the uh, is at 27.42. Uh, the result that would be actually good for us would be 33, so it's still is outside of our confidence interval, but we've got from our model more. We got a tighter confidence interval, moved in the right direction, but it is still biased by the quality of experiment. As you can see, the experiment was very spread. It included the right value, but it wasn't well represented. So really, this is something uh, that you had before in many multiple cases, garbage in, garbage out. We got uh, bad data and we cannot do anything with bad data, especially without proper information. If we had good information on the actual speed of light, then we could, uh, so we could have an informative prior, especially for mean and for our scale, then we have something completely different situation. Because in that situation, we could be able to improve this. But we don't have pro possess proper expert knowledge at this moment in order to improve our results. Include our analysis of our student team model, a robust model, uh, by a product, posterior predictive check. Again, we need to create, for uh, RV's purposes, uh, the inference data object using the uh, fit uh, using the uh, prompt command, uh, command from Pi, again with the same parameters as previously, and we can compare our simulated data with the uh, with uh, the actual measured data. As you can see, our uh, concentration of data is much better. The distribution is not as uh, distribution of uh, date uh, of the uh, as the predicted values is not as dispersed as in case of normal distribution, it captures well the bulk of the measurements. It does not provide any samples or very limited samples in the uh, in the values of uh, around the outliers. Uh, it would be much more visible with the histogram, and it, we would be able to also to see that because student distribution is much more heavier tail uh, heavy tail than the distribution of uh, uh, normal distribution, there are certain individual samples happening somewhere here, even further uh, further down the road because of the uh, of the student distribution, but uh, the most of the, uh, the samples is located here and our uh, mean of predictive, uh, uh, posterior predictive mean is very well, is approximating our uh, bulk of data sets rather well. Of course, this is the uh, the issues of still not being representative for the actual speed of light, which of course comes from the fact that our data does not correspond well to the actual uh, speed of light, which we could see here in the uh, plot we've seen before. The last thing we want to do is we see that okay student team model is better than the uh, normal model in both in analysis of actual predictive results and also in the posterior, uh, uh, posterior uh, predictive checks. However, we can also support ourselves with certain more algorithmic tools for model, model analysis. And we'll just give now a highlight of ideas of model comparison, which will hopefully be able to come back later uh, in our uh, our lecture in a few weeks uh, when we will be able to use some kind of tools of model comparison. At this moment, we will use something that is known from machine learning or in machine learning community that is cross validation. Cross validation is removing part of the data, the train, training data, fitting the model with this uh, limited set, and checking it with the uh, with the data that was left. In case, the most uh, basic idea is so, something called leave one out cross validation, which is we only remove one sample and we repeat it over the entire data set. However, this requires refitting our, uh, our, data, uh, our model multiple times over the entire data set, which can be time consuming, especially with Monte Carlo computation. 
hopefully, uh, luckily, there is an option. The option is estimated uh, leap one out cost validation using something called Pareto smooth importance sampling, which uses the values of logarithmic likelihood, which we computed earlier, and we've uh, uh, and estimates the value of the cross validation. This will be something that we'll return to later during the lecture, uh, during the course, hopefully. Uh, in our case, what we actually want need to do, we need to use our inference data objects. We have put it into a dictionary because this dictionary will allow us to make a nicer plots, and we run the az compare function which calls the uh, which computes the something called expected logarithmic uh, predictive loss uh, which is uh, a, which is a value for uh, that corresponds how our model is uh, better or worse and for that it will be using the uh, look cross validation. Here we get some warnings or some information. First one is not interesting, it comes for the uh, Arvis uh, uh, modification that it has changed the default method. However, what we are really interested in here are the results for both our models. We get the warning that estimate shape parameter of Pareto distribution is greater than 0 0.7 for one or more samples. Uh, this is sounds uh, uh, like magic, but really this is the information that our estimate finds something problematic in our data. Is as it said here, this is more likely to happen with a non-robust model and highly influential observation. So in our case, we have highly influential observation that uh, make problem for both of our models, both the. Uh, student T and the uh, normal models here, so we need to know that there is problem with Pareto distribution uh, uh, shape parameter, which should be less than 0.74. Uh, however, we get the comparison table. This comparison table is in the form of pandas distribution, and it gives us ranking of our models because value of this criterion, the uh, leave one out cross-validation or LU is given by the uh, the higher it is the better is the option it's uh, sometimes we use, it is used on different scale uh, which uh, comparing something called devi deviance and deviance is actually the value of it multiplied by minus two so not much uh, much of the difference what is important LU is an uh, uh, it is a, va uh, a variable, uh, this is a random variable, so it has also some uncertainty, especially it has its own standard error, and standard error of, and also what is, we are interested in is something called the DLU, which DLU is a difference between best and the next model. Of course, if we use more, there will be more values in this column. And this value, this difference, has also its own standard error. Because first model is the best, it doesn't have DLU and doesn't have a standard error here. For both of our models, we received warnings and we're using the logarithmic scale here. Uh, what is <coughs> additional bonus for using Arvis here is that we can get you know, it's such a nice plot inspired by a statistical rethinking book by Richard McElroth, which generally gives us the following information. First of all, the black box uh, dots are the in-sample device. It gives us information how our model fits the data that it has. The empty circle is the out-of-sample device. We are using LU, so the leap on out cross-validation, in order to ex get having our data predict how well it behaves for data that we do not have. And always in sample it will be better than out of sample, which is obvious. However, as we can see, for student team model these values are close. And additionally we have this difference and its own standard error. So 
they give us how close the models are to each other. If this bar would be overlapping of both our models, which those bars are the standard errors, we would have the issue of uh, that this model, the difference between models is very limited. In this case, these, uh, these models are significantly different. What is the main problem with all those uh, values is there is no interpretation of those values, those uh, of uh, Lu here. So difference of 100 or 20 is not really informative. Is the how uh, uh, how the, the how mo much models different from one another? So this might be a problematic issue. However, in the end, uh, we can see that student T model is a bit better, but the main conclusion still remains that even using this better model, we get a tighter estimate, moves mean moves in the right direction, but it is still biased because you, there are limitations of what you can do with bad data. Thank you very much.